هذه الذين استفا خصوصا على أفضلهم وقاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بأن لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam as we greet you here at uh, Masjid Kunzi in Mombasa with Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuh Our subject today is uh, an Islamic view of cryptocurrency cryptocurrency So if you have ever heard the term cryptocurrency can you show me with your hands up you never heard about it oh that's a that's a good sign <laughs> that's a good sign <laughs> like someone in Mombasa and I told him about Santa Claus he said who is Santa Claus <laughs> He says, I never heard who is Santa Claus. That's a good sign, Mombasa. You've never heard about cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is connected with the subject of riba. And we'll explain to you. And if you do not know what is riba, then your teachers have failed you. Your ulama have failed you. If you do not know what is riba, your scholars have failed you. Because they are the ones who are supposed to teach you. Riba is any money or wealth that you acquire the wrong way. The unjust transfer of wealth. Is riba. So when Africa is losing its wealth all the time and Europe is getting richer and richer and the United States is getting richer and richer, you know riba is at work. <laughs> when the rich in Africa are getting richer and richer and the poor remain permanently poor and get poorer and poorer, you know that's riba there's riba in the banking system when money is lent and money is borrowed on interest and all around the world today this is accepted as something that is legal and permissible to lend and to borrow money on interest that's what the world says, it's okay. But when you go in the grave, you learn something different. In the grave, you'll get a surprise. Oh, but my government never told me that. <laughs> in the grave, you learn that it is haram to lend and to borrow money and interest. And you learn that this is riba. And you will learn because your teachers never taught you that Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam cursed. He cursed all four. And he said that they're all equally guilty. The one who the one who takes riba the banking system 
the banker, the bank, the one who gives riba, you borrowed money and interest, and you're paying the installment with the extra amount. He cursed you. The one who record the transaction, he cursed him. And the two witnesses, he cursed them. And he said they're all equally guilty. We learn that in the grave, if the scholars don't teach it to us. The last revelation to come down in the Quran, the very last one, was the revelation in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declared war. He declared war on the money lender. And he said, my, my messenger also declared war on the money lender. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But if the money lender gives up the riba, then he's entitled to the return of the amount of money he lent you. So then the riba is the extra amount that you have to pay when you're repaying a loan. The extra amount that you have to repay, to pay when you are repaying a loan, that is riba. So you're not allowed to lend money and demand that it be returned to you with anything more. That's riba. He not only cussed, he said that if you consume one dirham of riba, and of course dirham is real money, it's a silver coin. Dirham is in the Quran. And dinar is real money, it's a gold coin. And dinar is in the Quran. And if the scholars don't tell you that, and you remain ignorant, then in the grave, you'd have to pay a price for that. He said, whoever consumes even one, one, one dirham of riba, it is equivalent to committing zina 36 times. He said that riba is comprised of 70 different parts and the smallest part of riba is equivalent to a man marrying his own mother. So riba is something terrible. He said that the age of Dajjal would be the age of Kathratul Riba. In other words, your enemies are going to use Riba to not only rip you off, but also to enslave you so that you will not be able to resist them. And that's where we are today. We have now become so miserably poor that everyone is struggling for his bread and no one has time to devote an effort to devote to resist the oppressor because it's a struggle to survive every day. What is cryptocurrency? Cryptocurrency is like the paper money that you have in your pocket. And you can't say, I don't know what is paper money, <laughs> because that's the money we've been using for the last 100 years. That's a long time. 
And uh, cryptocurrency is like paper money, except that paper money, you can hold it in your hand. You can take it home. You can put it underneath your pillow. Paper money, you can give it in charity and no one will know. It's a secret transaction. You give it and no one will know you gave. So, paper money still has some benefit that you can take it home and keep it by your home safely. But cryptocurrency is a form of electronic money. And uh, electronic money is money you cannot see. No African who is an African would accept money you can't see. No, you're not an African anymore. No, you, you, you have given up Africa. You have betrayed Africa. Huh? You're not worthy. You're not worthy of being called an African. You, you will accept money you can't see. <laughs> Electronic money is money you can't touch. Which African will accept money you can't touch? Is there such an Africa? Huh? Money <laughs> you can't see, money you can't touch. You have to have the brains of a donkey to accept that. Even a donkey is smarter than that. <laughs> because when the donkey sees that money, if he thinks it's food, he'll eat it. <laughs> Electronic money is money you cannot take home and put it underneath your pillow. No. And in Surat al Kafan, the Imam recited this now from Surat al Kafan. In Surat al kaf there was a believer who was dying and he was leaving behind orphan children and he had some inheritance for them and he could not find anyone who could keep the money for them until they grew up. So he dug a hole in the ground and he buried the money and then he built a wall you know about that don't you huh all right well then you should know can you bury electronic money huh no <laughs> no. no you can't bury electronic money no And so, this electronic money is worse than the paper money. But there was electronic money which was still in the name of the paper money. So you'll have the US dollar either as paper or as electronic money and you will have the euro as paper or as electronic money and this money was issued by a government a central bank so it's under the control of the central banks and through them the governments but uh, cryptocurrency 
is a different kind of electronic money. Cryptocurrencies are not issued by central banks. Governments have no control over them. Any Tom or Dick or Harry can issue cryptocurrencies. So why the departure from electronic money and paper money issued by central banks and by governments to a new form of electronic money not under the control of central banks, not under the control of governments. A business can all start a money. A Jama'a can start a new money. An individual can start a new money. <laughs> the answer is that the mastermind wants to prepare the way for one money for all of mankind. Even Mombasa will have to use that money. Haiti will have to use it. Venezuela will have to use it. Russia will have to use it. Argentina will have to use it. Mecca will have to use it. Everybody will have to use one money. So no more US dollars and no more Kenyan shillings. Goodbye. So who will issue this one money that is coming? Answer? That's right. The state of Israel. The state of Israel. The Israeli Central Bank. So there will only be one central bank in the world issuing one money for all of mankind. And whosoever controls the money will rule, will rule the world. It is as simple as that. You don't need a PhD from any university to understand. Even a schoolboy can understand. So then why? Why is it that the scholars of Islam cannot understand? That's a good question. When the Israeli Central Bank issues the one currency for all of mankind, it will, of course, be an electronic money. I don't think they'll use the term cryptocurrency anymore. It is Santa Claus who creates these names, fancy names like Arab Spring. And he uses these names in order to take us for a ride, to corrupt our thinking. When that one currency comes for all of mankind, the danger is even more, greater danger than what we now have today. For at that time, if you do not bow down and submit to Israel, and accept Israel as the ruling state in the world, which means bowing down to worship the job. Then what will they do to you? Number one, they can target you. You cannot buy and you cannot sell and you cannot keep money without a bank account. 
if you do not have a bank account, you cannot buy, you cannot sell, and you cannot keep money. So they can, they can refuse to give you a bank account. And when they refuse to give you a bank account, don't come to me and complain to me. Secondly, if you have a bank account, they can simply suspend it. And there's nothing you can do about it. Your money is in your account, but you cannot take it. You cannot use it. Number three, they can block your account permanently and you've lost all your money. They did this to Argentina about 30 years ago. This is called a trial balloon. And the government of Argentina blocked all banks accounts in Argentina for one month. No one could access their bank account for one whole month. And the government of Argentina got away with it. <laughs> so if they could do it for one month, they could do it for one year. So how will you survive when you have no money? Your money is in your account, but the account is blocked. Is this a subject of some importance to Mombasa? <laughs> well, look at look at how many people from Mombasa are here today to understand this important subject. When that one currency comes from all of mankind. They will monitor how you use your money. And when they see a profile, but he is never buying any alcohol. Oh. And he is never paying any money to prostitutes. Oh, look at that. And he is never investing his money in the stock market. Look at that. This is a dangerous man. He takes his children out of the school. We can see from the school fees, he's not paying school fees. He's teaching his children at home. This is a very dangerous man. From the time they see your profile, and it's very easy for them to do that in an electronic age they will immediately target you and suddenly your bank account is frozen and you can't complain to anyone and so what is coming to us in the future and cryptocurrencies is meant to prepare the way for that future is slavery and whoever does not submit to the state of Israel will now become a slave. How did we get here? Let us attempt to turn to the Quran so that the Quran might tell us what is money. Let us turn to Nabi Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala that our prophet may tell us what is money. Every time I lecture, I always quote at the beginning a passage from Surah Al-Nahl. Always, same passage. And I took it from my teacher. May Allah have mercy on his soul. Where Allah says, بَعْدَهُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَةِ بِيَانًا لِكُلِّ الشَّيْءٍ 
وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين. And we sent down the book, يعني the Quran. Sent it down and be O Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. In order that this Quran might explain all things. And so this Quran must explain what is money. And this Quran must explain to us the strange things which are happening in the world of money. Which is riba. And if our scholars do not teach the subject of riba, which is far more dangerous than the army and the military, far more dangerous than political oppression, this is the most dangerous thing of all economic and monetary slavery. If our scholars do not teach it, if our ulama do not teach it, either because they do not know the shabdi, either because they do not know the shabdi, or they are too scared to teach it. And if you accept that and you keep on following them, do you expect that you will succeed? And so let us turn to the Book of Allah. And let us turn to the Nabi of Allah. To explain this subject to us. And I want you to now listen carefully. Uh, can I get a, some water to be here? We all know who was Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu because Bilal was African. Bilal was African radiallahu ta'ala anhu. One day, Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu brought some dates and offered them to Nabi Muhammad He looked at the dates and he said, Bilal, these are very high quality dates. Where did you get them? What is the uh, Swahili word for dates? Tender. Huh? Tender. Tender. This is high quality tender. Tender. Where did you get them? These tender. So, Bilal said, O Messenger of Allah, I had two kilograms. I'm using modern weights. I had two kilograms of lower quality tender. And I exchanged them for this one kilogram of higher quality tender. If the two kilograms were worth, thank you. If the two kilograms of lower quality were worth uh, five thousand shillings each. This one kilogram of higher quality was worth ten thousand ten, ten thousand shillings. So in value they were the same. It was a fair exchange, not unjust. Oh Bilal said the Prophet Ali This is the essence, the heart of riba. Oh, but riba is terrible. So how could this be the heart of riba? To exchange two kilograms of tende 
So one kilogram. But uh, Omar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he exchanged one camel for four camels. His camel was an adult and the four were baby camels. So an exchange of one for four camels was halal. But an exchange of one for two with dates, ten days, haram, riba. Why is this one haram and riba? And that one is halal, no riba. To answer that question, which any schoolboy could have answered a hundred years ago, a hundred years ago. Today, not even the Darul Ulum will answer this question. That is how much knowledge has disappeared from the world today. The answer is located in a proclamation proclaimed by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. He said, if a transaction, a business transaction, involves an exchange of gold for gold, or silver for silver, or wheat for wheat, or barley for barley, or dates for dates, like this one with Bilal or salt for salt. Since it is like for like, it must be equal for equal. If you have one kilogram here, you must have one kilogram there. And it must be hand to hand, meaning it cannot be a credit transaction. It must be a cash transaction. Other than that, he said, it would be riba. Now then, put on your thinking cap, because Allah says that he sent down the Quran to people who think. They call me a tafakkar. We have gold, we have silver, we have wheat, we have barley, we have dates, we have salt. Six of them. What is common to all six? Is there something common to all six? Yes. They were all used as money. They were all used as money for buying and selling. Money is that which is used as a medium of exchange to buy and to sell. Money is that which is used as a measure of value. How much is this worth and how much is that worth? And money is that which is used as a store of value. A store of value. So if I put some money aside and then I sleep for 300 years, when I wake up, the money should still be able to buy the food. Are you with me? Are you with me or you've lost, I've lost you? Huh? If I sleep for how many years? 300 years. When I wake up, the money should still be able to buy the food. I wonder if your shilling can do that. Huh? Your Kenyan shilling. After 300 years. 
So money is a store of value. And what is common to all six is that they were all used as money. So in Medina, in the market, if there was ever a shortage of dinar and dirham, gold and silver coins, what would they use as money? What would they use as money? Dates. Dates. Was it ten days? Ten days. Ten days. Ten day. They would use ten day as money. Why? No one. Because all six gold, silver, wheat, barley, dates and salt all had one thing in common. In addition to being money. And it was that they all had the value of the money was inside the money. It was not in the pockets of some American people in Washington. No. The value of the money was inside the money. So we say that this is money with intrinsic value. And uh, so when there was a shortage of gold and silver in the market, they would use dates as money. Because dates have value, ten day has value inside the dates. It has intrinsic value. It has value created by Allah. Number three. They would use dates as money because there was an abundant supply in the market. So if you are in the island of Java, in Indonesia, I just spent some time in Java myself, and you want to use money, which is sunnah money, and there is a shortage of gold and silver coins, what would you use as money in Java? Somebody please tell me. Huh? I can't hear you. I can't hear you, Mombasa. Huh? Rambutan? No. You would use rice as money. Rice. But that would be rice with the husk on it. I think it is called paddy. Paddy. You would use the paddy as money. Okay? Mm. If you are in Java. Okay, let me test you again. You know Fidel Castro stopped smoking cigars, don't you know? Before he died. Okay. So if you are in the island of Cuba, and you want to bring back real money, sunnah money, and you have a shortage of gold and silver, what would you use as money? Huh? Don't tell me tobacco. Answer? Sugar is correct. Sugar. Why? Because the rice and the sugar have intrinsic value. Value created by Allah and they are in abundant supply in the market. So now we can answer the question, why is it that an unequal exchange of dates was haram and riba, but the unequal exchange of camels was not? Answer? You could not use camels as money. <laughs> huh? you, you work for the whole month and your boss gives you your salary and your salary is a goat. And you're taking the goat at home and the goat fell along and died. So when you reach home, you told your wife, salary died. 
he said, go tell the boss. The boss said, when I gave you your salary, salary was alive. Uh -huh. You can't use animals as money. And therefore, that is why the explanation camel for four was okay, a lot. But because you use dates as money, if you allow an unequal exchange of dates, you open the door for the money lender, who will give you 100 dirhams in exchange for 200 which will be a loan on a hundred percent interest. And this is why the Prophet said, Binal, this is the essence of riba, the heart of riba. So now we have a definition of money from the Quran and from the Sunnah. Because the word dinar is in the Quran, the word dirham is in the Quran. The Quran prohibits money being lent on interest. Yes. And the Quran prohibits you from turning away from this money and using another bogus money. The definition of money in the Quran and Sunnah is that money must always be either gold and silver coins or when gold and silver coins are in short supply in the market money must always be articles of food consumption which have intrinsic value which have a shelf life not like mangoes and rambutan, no. They have a shelf life, they can last for some time. And money which is in abundant supply in the market, this is the definition of money in the Quran and Sunnah. But today, the world of the scholars of Islam has fallen silent. And you cannot find anyone who can give you this elementary, elementary definition. This is an elementary definition of money in the Quran and Sunnah. Either because they don't understand it, I don't know why, or they do not want to do it because they know that once they define money in the Quran and Sunnah, there will be problems for them. What are the problems? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has condemned fasad. It is a terrible sin. If someone steals, we simply cut off his hand. That's all. But when you commit fasad, it's worse than that. The punishment for fasad is to cut the hands and the feet from opposite sides and then crucify. That is in the Quran. Fasad is not just that which corrupts, but corrupts in such a way as to destroy. And Allah says in the Quran, Inna ya'juja wa ma'juja mufsiduna fil ab. That Gog and Magog will commit the greatest facade on the earth. Today, everything is corrupted. The political system is corrupt. The economy is corrupt, the market is corrupt, the money is corrupt, the educational system is corrupt. Sports has been corrupted, entertainment has been corrupted, the sexual life has been corrupted and destroyed. 
There is corruption everywhere. And Allah says in the Quran, in this Quran has come to explain all things. So there must be an explanation in the Quran for this corruption. Where is it? Why? Why has the world of scholars of Islam, why have they not understood this subject? It is strange to me. Not only do, not, do they not understand, but there is something even stranger. That I have been teaching this subject for 20, 25 years now, around the world. And they refuse, they refuse to accept anything that comes from me. And so all that I can say is wait, brother, wait for the grave. And you have a bitter surprise at the grave. If you would not listen in this world, the consequences in the grave are going to be terrible for you because you are betraying Allah and His Messenger. You are betraying the Quran. Allah has told us that Gog and Magog are going to corrupt the world. And we know that Gog and Magog have been released, not sent, released. When these people are brought back to this town to reclaim it as their own, 2,000 years after Allah had expelled them and banned their return. And today they are back in Jerusalem. Today they have returned to Jerusalem after 2,000 years. And instead, of asking what is the explanation in the Quran which explains how the Jews have come back to the Holy Land to Jerusalem after 2,000 years to reclaim it as their own. What do we do? I'll tell you what we do. <laughs> we eat our biryani and we go home and sleep. I don't know what's the favorite meal of Mombasa. Biryani? Oh, look at that. <laughs> we eat our biryani and go home and sleep. Is that a scholar of Islam? Gog and Magog are the ones responsible for bringing the Jews back to the Holy Land. You don't believe me? Wait until you die. You believe I'm wrong? Wait until you die and then you'll know who is right and who is wrong. I am fed up now. Fed up teaching this subject to a people who will not care and will not understand. And therefore, Gog and Magog are located in modern Western civilization. That civilization was given power, a power that even Zulkarnain does not have. And when they were released into the world, they used that power to conquer and to colonize the whole world, including East Africa. The British were here in Kenya. The British were in Uganda. Um, I think the Germans were in Tan Tanganyika. The Germans, yeah. And... Uh, what was that? Trinidad and Tobago is British. That's why I speak English. British, yeah. Uh, but my heart is not British, no. And uh, when they colonized us, 
they never decolonized until they had put in place that which they could use to continue to rule us by proxy. So they did not leave Kenya and they did not leave India until they had taken gold and silver out of the market as money and replaced it with paper. That's right, paper. And this world of paper money, uh, it's a pity that this subject is not taught to the scholars of Islam. They don't know the subject. I went to Iran. I met with the highest, highest, highest of the Ayatollahs of Iran, and I found they did not know the subject. So the Shia were just as ignorant as the Sunni. The, they brought together all the whole world in one, the one umbrella of paper money. And they gave us what they call a monetary system in which one money was king. It was called the international currency. And all the rest of the world of money have to submit to this one currency. And whoever had that international currency ruled the world. And the world of paper money passed through three stages. And Allah speaks in the Quran about three stages. Allah speaks about three stages of a shadow. And when the three stages are completed, the shadow will disappear and the real man will appear. Listen to the Quran. Proceed. Ila zillin to a shadow. These salas is shark. We should have three parts. In the first part of that shadow, the British sterling pound became the international currency. And London became the financial capital of the world and Pax Britannica came into being. But you need to do a little bit of studies to understand that. You can't devote all your life to the market. You cannot devote all your life to making money and no, no time at all to study to be able to understand. You have to sacrifice some time to study. And then came the transfer from the British pound to the US dollar. And this happened in 1944 at Bretton Woods. And when the US dollar replaced the sterling pound as the international currency, then Washington became the financial capital of the world. And Pax Britannica gave way to Pax Americana. But the shadow has three parts. So there has to be a third stage to follow. It was Pax Britannica and then Pax Americana. And there has to be something else coming. And therefore, a new money to replace the U.S. dollar. Now you and I know. We now know it because we have been studying in Muhammad is the man. We know that it is one universal electronic money which is coming, and it will be issued by the Israeli Central Bank. So Israel become 
the financial capital of the world tomorrow. And Pax Americana will depart and Pax Judaica will replace it. And after Pax Judaica has completed its stage, the shadow will disappear. And when the shadow disappears, Al Masihud Dajjal will then appear in person. And he will say, An Al Masih, I am the Messiah. What was the danger of the paper money? The danger of the paper money was that their money became known as hard currencies. You're familiar with that term, hard currencies. And our money was worthless. They took paper and they gave to it fictitious value and called it money. And in so doing, they were creating wealth out of nothing. But only Allah can do that. So whoever attempts to create wealth out of nothing is trying to be like Allah and is therefore committing a very transparent act of shirk. And that's the one, one sin that Allah will not forgive. When he gave his paper money fictitious value and committed shirk, we did the same. So the Islamic Republic of Pakistan would also print the paper and give it a fictitious value and all the ulama in Pakistan accept it as money and commit shirk. And so around the world today of paper money, all of us sign shirk. And so now we could understand the Hadith because of Gog and Magog. It is Yawmul Qiyamah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to Adam alayhi salam. And the Hadith is in Sahih Bukhari four times. And he says to Adam alayhi salam, take out the people for Jahannam. That sounds strange to me. Allah is telling Adam Malaysia, take out the people for Jahannam. And Adam alayhi salam asks, how many are they, O oh Allah? And Allah says, out of every 1,000, take 999 for Jahannam. The companions of the Prophet والسلام, were terrified when they heard that. So he looked upon them and he smiled. He said, the one for Jannah will be from you. Someone who faithfully follows the truth which has come from Allah. But he went on to say that the 999 would all be and so as we accept the paper money with fictitious value as money, we all become There is more danger to it than that. Their money, hard currency, had its value linked to gold, the US dollar. And international law established it 
at 35 US dollars for one ounce of gold. You wouldn't believe me. Yeah, you wouldn't believe me when you know the price of gold now. International law established the value of the US dollar at 35 US dollars for one ounce of gold. Number two, that you could take your US dollars to Washington and give it to them and they had to give you the gold. But you and I could do that, only a central bank could do that. This is called redeeming, redeeming the paper for gold. And uh, all the rest of the world of money had no link with gold, no convertibility to gold, they were just paper. And the value was determined in relation to the US law. So the system was designed to establish the US dollar as his majesty, the ruler of the world. And we, excuse my language, the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, like a bunch, excuse my language, a bunch of jackasses with have no knowledge in their head. The whole Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, including Islamic Pakistan and Islamic Republic of Iran and each everybody entered into this bogus monetary system of paper money. And we all abandoned, abandoned money with intrinsic value. So if Allah is waging war on us today, and if the curse of the Prophet is upon us, we should not be surprised. As their money started to lose value, the US dollar started at 35. But then in 1971, it was, it was um, no, in 1966, it was uh, General Charles de Gaulle in France. He realized that this was a game. And France was always in competition with the United States. France was very nationalist. And Charles de Gaulle recognized that the United States were, was taking us for a ride with this unjust monetary system. They were printing more paper than they had gold. So de Gaulle stood up in the French National Assembly in 1966. And he denounced the monetary system as unjust. Did our scholars do that? Did the Mufti ever do that? <laughs> did the Darulum ever do that, what Charles de Gaulle did? And the Americans didn't like that, the Jews didn't like that, so they brought down de Gaulle very quickly. But the successors of de Gaulle continued the same policy. And in 1971, they brought, I think, three billion dollars to Washington. They said, Uncle Sam, we want the gold. <laughs> and Nixon realized the game had now become too dangerous because they didn't have the gold for the dollars. If I printed more paper than I had gold, they'd put me in jail. Yeah, it's like writing checks and you don't have the money. You go to jail. Well, that, when the United States did that, who could put them to jail? So what Nixon did was to say, well, we gave our word, but we don't have to keep our word. So he reneged, he tore up the Bretton Woods Accord. And he said, from now on, the United States will no longer redeem paper money for gold. And so from 1971, 
the US dollar was no longer linked with gold. But the value of the US dollar began to fall. From 35, it went to 40. And so in 1973, the United States pulled off. It pulled off the biggest stunt in all of history. It was called the Arab-Israeli War. The United States knew that if a war started between Israel and the Arabs, that King Faisal of Saudi Arabia would impose an oil boycott on the United States. They knew that. And they wanted it. Why? As soon as the war started in October 1973, Faisal imposed an oil boycott. And the Arab oil producing countries followed suit and impose an oil boycott on the United States. You were not born as yet, but we know that miles long, the lines outside gas stations in the United States were miles long hmm? to buy gas. <laughs> what happened was that the price of oil went up from $3 a barrel to $12 a barrel, 400% rise. But that meant that the value of the US dollar collapsed from $40 for one ounce of gold to 160. So the value of the paper money went down when the price of gold went up. That was what the United States was waiting for. And when that happened, Kissinger then flew to Riyadh in Saudi Arabia and met with Faisal. And he was successful in skillfully and cunningly convincing Faisal, who had only peanuts in his head, that if Saudi Arabia would sell the oil for only US dollars, nothing else. You cannot buy oil for anything else with anything else other than US dollars. If Saudi Arabia will impose that condition, then said Kissinger, the $12 a barrel that you're now getting is peanuts. You get far, far, far more than that in years to come. And of course, Kitchinger was right. <laughs> and Faisal, because he didn't know the Quran, the Saudis normally don't know the Quran. No. He agreed to that. And once he agreed to that, the other Arab oil producing countries they came on board, and then OPEC came on board, and the US dollar was saved. The US dollar now became a petrodollar. What is a petrodollar? We go to Sahih Bukhari, And Nabi Muhammad alayhi salam, alayhi salatu wa salam, prophesied that in Akhiru Zaman, the river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold. And people will fight for that gold. And each would say, I, sorry, and 999, sorry, I, I think I'm a bit tired now. <laughs> People will fight for that goal. And 99 out of every 100 who fight for that mountain of gold will be killed. And each would say, I would be the one who will survive. 
but the believers must not touch that gold. So we are not going to be part of that wall for that mountain of gold. And uh, what happened in 1974 was that the mountain of gold came out from underneath the river. Are you able to see it? No? You can't see the mountain of gold from underneath the river as yet? There are two kinds of ayat in the Quran. There are ayat mutashabiha and ayat muhkama. Ayat muhkama are verses which are plain and clear. But ayat mutashabiha are verses which have to be interpreted to get the meaning. So this mountain of gold underneath the river, this is not a plain and clear statement. This has to be interpreted. And in 1974, when Faisal agreed to sell oil for only US dollars, an ocean of oil underneath the river now began to function as a mountain of gold when the petrodollar was born and the petrodollar monetary system allowed the united states to become fabulously wealthy far beyond anything they had ever dreamed of before to the extent that today the president of the united states can simply take a piece of paper one piece of paper and write on it seven trillion u.s dollars sign his name send it to federal reserve the Federal Reserve then transfers to the banks, the favorite banks, seven trillion dollars. Of course, it's only paper. But when we, the jackasses of the world, when we go to the IMF, as the late Morsi did in Egypt, may Allah have mercy on his soul, Morsi. And we borrow money from the IMF and we pledge to repay it. Then it becomes money. <laughs> yes. And so they became fabulously wealthy beyond anything that they had ever dreamed of because, because an ocean of oil underneath the river now began to function as a mountain of gold. I have respect for Africa. I'll tell you why. The greatest and the most powerful voice in the part of the world from which I came, the most powerful voice to stand up in response of oppression to challenge the oppressor and to do so with words which were like bullets and yet to do it so gracefully and so eloquently was an African man it was Malcolm X an African American and so I respect an African because an African must have insight the African must have spirituality from the earth. The African should be able to see what others cannot see. And so I hope I would not be disappointed by Mombasa. That you be able to recognize that an ocean of oil underneath the river 
now began to function as a mountain of gold. But he said that they will fight for that gold. And when they do so, 99 out of every 100 would be killed. And that is the great war. That's Armageddon. That's the Malhamah. There's never been a war in all of history in which 99% of combatants have been killed. None. Never. So this war which is coming is the war for the mountain of gold. It's not a war over Korea. It's not a war over Ukraine. It's not a war over Iran. No. The war which is coming, the great war, is a war which is being fought over money. That's right. Because the amount in the gold is under threat today. China has launched the biggest attack on that mountain of gold, China. And China could not have done it if China was not supported by Russia. Because China does not have the military power. But when the Soviet Union collapsed and China saw Russia returning to Orthodox Christianity from communism, the Chinese realized that this was momentous change and the Chinese realized we can trust this Russia while we could not trust the Soviet Union. And so the Chinese reached out to Russia and Russia responded and the Chinese-Russian alliance came into being which includes military cooperation and with support from Russia, China was able to launch the attack on the mountain of gold. And so BRICS came into being. BRICS is uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. But actually, it's actually Russia and China because South Africa is not a big league player and uh, India is playing both sides <laughs> and uh, Brazil has now turned away and joined the other side. So it's Russia and China, this alliance, which is challenging the mountain of gold. And that mountain of gold is about to collapse. The monetary system is about to collapse. China, for example, has said to Saudi Arabia, I forgot to tell you that when they designed this bogus monetary system, they committed another act of shit. The first act of shit was to print paper and give it a fictitious value playing God. The second act of shit was to make haram what Allah made halal. The articles of agreement of the International Monetary Fund prohibit the use of gold as money. But Allah has permitted it. And Surah to tawbah informs us that if you make halal what Allah made haram, that is shirk. This is Surah al -Tawbah. So if you make haram what Allah made halal, that is shirk. And that's what the International Monetary Fund has done. The reason why they have prohibited the use of gold and silver as money is because on the day that gold and silver becomes legal tender, that you can use it for buying and selling, their bogus money will collapse. That's why. And instead of our defying the International Monetary Fund and denying the governments which are submitting to the International Monetary Fund, instead of us challenging them and resisting them, we've all submitted to them. That is the that is the betrayal of the scholars of Islam. 
And so now we are at that position in time when the petrodollar monetary system is going, when the big war takes place. And in the same way that the sterling pound gave us Pax Britannica and the US dollar gave us Pax Americana, there is a tomorrow coming when a new currency after the nuclear war, a new currency will give us Pax Judaica. And after Pax Judaica has lasted for a day like a week, does anyone know what I'm talking about? A day like a week? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Yes, you know. You know, okay, you know. Yeah. Hadith of Sahih Muslim. And when the Dajjal is released, he'll live on earth for 40 days. Yawmun Kasana. A day which would be like a year. Yawmun Kashar. A day which would be like a month. Yawmun Kajum'a. A day which would be like a week. وَسَائِرُ أَيَّامِهِكَ أَيَّامِكُمْ And all his days, like our days, at that time he will be in our world of space and time. So in fact, Judaica will not last for a long time, a day like a week. When Pax Judaica has completed a day like a week, the shadow will disappear. The shadow which is in which surah? Which surah? Mursala, mashallah. The shadow will disappear. And then, then you see the dwell in human form. But at that time there can be no bogus money. Because every Jew knows what is bogus money. So Israel Israel will have to bring back dinar and dirham as money. Yes, for buying and selling. They would not use this term of God, they use a different term. And when Israel brings back dinar and dirham as money, all the rest of the world will have to do the same. I prefer to use more colorful language. All the rest of the jackasses all over the world will have to do the same as this. Because they eat the biryani and they go home and they sleep and they deserve what is coming for them. Yes, they deserve what is coming for them because they betray the Quran and they betray Muhammad and guess what the Prophet said about them. Let us quote this hadith and we'll end and then we have a little time for question and answer. He said, You should It will not be long before that time will come. La yabqa min al Islam ilasmu when nothing will remain of Islam except the name. The heart of the deen is gone. Only the shell remains. Islam came to free the world, to liberate the world. And that struggle to liberate mankind is gone. And only the shell remains. What I am coming al Quran illa rasmu. And nothing will remain of the Quran except the words which are mechanically recited. Because no one, no one studies the Quran. He said, Masajidu humamilatun wa hiya kharabu min al huda. At that time, the masajid will be grand structures, but devoid of guidance. And now listen. And the ulama of those people, Shabrun Nasirin Man Tahta Adim is Sama, will be the worst people beneath the sky. The worst people beneath the sky would be the scholars of Islam of that time. مِنَ عِنْدِهِمْ تَخْلُجُ الْفِتْنَةِ وَفِيهِمْ تَعُودُ 
they would be the centers of corruption, corrupting the people. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might open our eyes, that we might recognize cryptocurrency for what it is, a stage towards our eventual slavery. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتبع علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم برحمةك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين. We have a little time for you. If you have any questions or more importantly, more importantly, if you have any comments, yes, please. Come closer. Come closer. I'm an old man. I can't hear properly. Hussain Al Jafri. Hussain Al Jafri. Yes. 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 Yes.
is, it is haram according to the Quran, but uh, the reason behind it is the exploitation of uh, uh, poor people by strong uh, rich people, business people. Now, for example, uh, Almani Lenda, uh, uh, Almani Lenda can, can uh, just a minute, if Almani Lenda gives uh, 300 shillings to a, I can't understand what you're saying. Oh, yeah, go ahead. If this is according to Islam. Riba is haram. Now, why it is haram behind it? It is because to protect the the weaker against the stronger. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, for example, uh, I lend uh, a money lender gives to a poor man three hundred shillings uh, 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 as the value of it in in 20 years time he gave him 300 shillings now the person who is supposed to to give back what he he borrowed from the stronger man if he gives the 300 shillings uh, the value of 300 shillings in in 20 years time uh, is very low uh, for example if, before it could buy a bicycle, but when I read, you give me it, will just buy uh, sweets, something like that. So that, what, uh, what can you, how can you reconcile uh, that uh, money lender to get back from the poor man? Okay. The Quran gives us two lessons and why Allah has prohibited riba. The first is in Surah Al-Baqarah. The money lender says that lending money on interest is just another form of business. <laughs> and Allah says, no. وَأَحَلَّ اللَّهُ الْبَيْعَ وَحَرَّمَ riba." That Allah has made business halal and He has made riba haram. Full stop. He now forces us to think because He doesn't give us all the knowledge on the plate. We have to search for it, we have to think. So we are now forced to ask the question. In what way is a riba transaction not a business transaction? Why is it that a riba transaction does not qualify as a business transaction? And the answer is that a business transaction, you can make a profit, you can suffer a loss. Riba transaction has no loss. No. They, insulate themselves from loss. I give you 100, you give me 200. Come rain or sunshine, you gotta give me the 200. And if you don't have the 200, you have to mortgage something. Mortgage your land, mortgage your house. I have to get my pound of fresh rain or sunshine. So it does not qualify as a business transaction because you do not embrace risk. What happens when you do business and you take a chance? You can make a profit, you can suffer a loss. Allah can now intervene, take from some and give to others. And so he distributes and he redistributes wealth. So the rich will not remain forever rich and the poor will not remain forever poor. This is a healthy economy in which wealth is circulating through the economy, not because government is redistributing. When government redistributes, it becomes corruption. <laughs> but because Allah is redistributing. So as soon as riba enters the economy, you now have this sick economy 
in which wealth no longer circulates through the economy. The rich remain forever rich and the poor are imprisoned in permanent poverty. This is the first reason. The second explanation is in Surah al Rum, where Allah says, وَمَا أَيْتَيْتُمْ مِنْ رِبًا لِيَرْبُوَ فِي أَمْوَالِ النَّاسِ فَلَا يَرْبُوَ إِنَّ اللَّهِ وَمَا أَتَيْتُ مِنْ زَكَاتٍ تُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُدْعِفُونَ That what you give in charity, seeking Allah's pleasure, Allah's faith, will increase many times with Allah. But what you put out in riba, seeking to increase your wealth at the expense of others, will not increase with Allah. So it is a contrast now between charity and riba. Over there the contrast is between business and riba. Over here the contrast between charity and riba. For stuff, we have we are forced to think. What is the difference between charity and riba? The Quran wants us to think. That is what we are not doing. <laughs> a, a, an act of charity is one in which you give and you take nothing in return. Riba is the opposite. <laughs> in an act of riba you take and you give nothing in return. That's what Europe has been doing. So if they're only taking and taking and giving nothing in return, one day Africa will have nothing and they will have everything. <laughs> And we will be just a herd of donkeys with no brains in our head that we allow them to rip us off. You see? These are the two reasons Allah has given in the Quran why riba has been prohibited. Is that the question you ask? The poor man received 200 shillings oh, from yes, them. Yes, so, yes. Uh, to cover up, yes. the money lender put interest so that it yes. could help him in future. Three times in the Quran, Allah has commanded, don't rip off people. Three times. Don't rip off people. Do not cause the value of people's property, people's wealth to be constantly diminished, prohibited. So the falling value of money and the falling value of goods because the price is going up is prohibited in the Quran. If you use the money that Allah has ordained, then prices will go up and down based on demand and supply. That's a good market. But when you use the bogus money, what happens? When you went to sleep, your money could have bought a camel. And when you woke up five years later, it could only buy a donkey. And you go back to sleep, you wake up five years later, you could only buy a goat. And you go back to sleep, and you wake up five years later, you could only buy chicken. But when you use the money that Allah gave, and you go to sleep, you can wake up 300 years later, and the money can still buy the food. So you do not compensate for the loss of value of your money with riba by adding something to it. Because two harams don't make a halal. What you do is you denominate the loan in gold and silver. That's what you do. So when the time comes to repay the loan, regardless of the value of the paper money, you pay back the loan in gold and silver. Okay, uh, quarter past six, any more questions? Uh. I just wanted to know that uh, what about the house, uh, household articles? 
household articles, those are being sold on installments. If a house is being sold on installments. Household articles. Household articles. Those are being sold on higher purchase basis yes. installment. Yes. What is this business? Is it yes. ribbon? No. The question is if we're selling something on credit. Installments. I heard the question. <laughs> I heard the question, yes. I heard the question. <laughs> installments is credit. Whether you use the word installments or use any other words, it's qualified as a credit. And this amount is added in the actual price. I know, I know. Future price. Yeah, I know, I know. So what yeah. is this? My answer to the, the, sorry, the question is, an article is being sold on credit, meaning you have time to pay. Whether you are paying month by month or from time to time is irrelevant. The question is, an article is being sold on credit, you are given being, you're being given time to pay. Is it permissible to add an extra amount to the cost of the article because of time. The answer is, in Islam, time does not equate to money. Money cannot increase over time. A credit transaction must have the same price as a cash transaction. So tell the Islamic bank to go and jump in the Indian Ocean. That's where you came from, go back in the ocean. The so-called Islamic bank. That's why some masajid close their doors on me and some muftis refuse to give me permission to teach because I call a spade a spade. The house is on sale for one million shillings. I don't have the one million. So I go to the Islamic bank. This bogus Islamic bank says to me, we will buy the house for the one million shillings and we will sell it to you for three million shillings. So I say, excuse me? What did you say? Why would I pay three million shillings when the market price is one million shillings? If it's a cash transaction, you should make an appointment for me with a good psychiatrist. My head is bad. No, it's not a cash transaction. It's a credit transaction. And so the extra amount over the cash price is because of time, because of time. To increase the price because of time is the essence of riba. That's why. So the cash price and the credit price in Islam must always be the same. But you must denominate the price in dinar and dirham if it's a credit transaction. So when you wait for your money to come, your money will not be leaking. You know money leaks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any more questions? I think it's time for Maghrib now? Yeah. yeah. One more question. Come, come, come. Difficult for me to hear, so that's why I came down here. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum. When you refer to Israel, uh, is there any difference between Israel as people, individual, or Israel as a state, as a Jewish state, or American? Is American as people, or American as Washington? 
because I understand is maybe all, not all Israelites of Israel have the same ideology state like the the rulers, eh? just like the Saudi, Saudians, Saudi Arabians, and the kingdom. Eh? So Israel is it Israel is a state or is a Jewish? Israel is people or a Jewish is a state? There are some questions I don't answer. <laughs> I have to keep that knowledge secret. <laughs> this is one of those questions, yeah. I, I won't answer that question, no. Yeah. yeah. Time for Salat. We are using, uh, sorry, we are using the M-Pesa, I mean, uh, transaction here. M-Pesa? Yeah, that's one. Uh, uh, it's a uh, mobile money. Mobile money. It's a mobile money. Yeah. Mpesa. Yeah. It's Mpesa. Yeah. Okay. Not shilling. Is it haram or is it? I don't know what is Mpesa. Uh, uh, I mean, it's electronics also. Send money from one person to another person. Yeah. Now that third person takes something from you in the middle. Even uh, when you are uh, borrowing are money. Are we allowed to charge for taking money from one person and delivering to another? Of course we are. Why should that man be working for free? This man is taking your money and delivering it somewhere. He's like a messenger. And you want him to work for free? <laughs> okay. Rabbana takabal minna kante samir alim. كتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام تبارك ربنا وتعاليك يا ذا الدلال والإكرام سمعنا وعطعنا وفرانك ربنا وليك المصير وصلى الله تعالى على خيرك محمد وعلى آله وعلى أصحابه أجمعين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين I leave for uh, Zanzibar tomorrow and spend four days and come back so I'll be here next جمعة and then Saturday, and then Sunday and Monday, four days, then we leave for Nairobi. So take, pay attention for the lectures that's coming, okay?